notification to order. Um, the first thing on our order of business is to review and approve the agenda for tonight's uh, meeting. Could I have could everybody review it? And if I could have a, a motion to approve the agenda. Sherry? Second? Brendan? All those in favor? Penny? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Device is down. Okay, any of those. All right, moving on. Um, <laughs> the next thing on our agenda is to approve um, a couple sets of minutes with our um, meeting being canceled on the 8th. Uh, the first set of minutes is from our January 25th, 2016 meeting. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes? Hazel, may I have a second? Jen, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Marie's. Okay. Um, and moving on to the February 4th special meeting. If you could look at those. It's a, okay, it's a, second pa a separate packet. And if I could have a motion to approve the special meeting minutes. Penny? Second? Hazel? Any, uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right, uh, moving on to comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes are allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Do we have anyone who'd like to speak? Seeing none, I will move on to reports and recognition. Um, our first item is the school climate update with Ms. Nora Daly. Dr. Lutze, you wanna? I will say a word or two and turn it over to Ms. Bianca or Ms. Daly, as Ms. Daly takes to the podium. Um, first, let me say thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight. I think we have an, an exciting presentation ahead from our uh, elementary students over at East and some students, fifth and sixth grade students over at Sachs. Uh, to talk a bit about the school climate initiatives. As you know, uh, the board had a presentation about the school climate initiative about a year ago. Uh, talk, and at that presentation, we had some students from the upper school at Sachs come and speak. So it's, um, we're eager to hear from some of our elementary students and our lower level students at Sachs, our fifth and sixth grade students there. Uh, to learn about the school climate work that's been going on. This is a continuation at SACS and a bit of a new, uh, new beginning at the elementary level, uh, working in line with the work that we began last year. And Ms. Daly has been spearheading this for us. Uh, the board may recall last year, Ms. Daly's role was expanded a bit uh, to really focus on school climate K-12 across the district uh, and to uh, bring that kind of an alignment and focus to the work for all of our students across the district, and she's been very successful in doing so. Um, Daryl, I'll allow you to do your intro. Thank you, Dr. Lutze. Uh, you just said everything that I would have said, <laughs> um, and it's all true. I would just add that uh, Nora has so wonderfully been shepherding all the school climate work that has been happening in our schools with our school administrators and our staff and our students. And I spent some time uh, moving around the schools with her a few weeks ago and looking at some of the work that's going to be presented to you this evening and it is uh, awesome. Um, I'm very proud of the students who are here and of all the work that they've been doing to make their schools uh, the wonderful places that they are and continue to be and it's really great work and I'd like to thank Nora for shepherding that and that's all I'll say. And um, I, I cannot possibly stand here alone so I'm going to ask all my student friends to come and join me over here. <clears throat> This required a lot of choreography. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I, I'll just um, start by saying in front of you, you have a little bit of historical information. I thought a little background might be helpful. Um, in previous presentations, I've done a lot of talking. My goal today is to do as little talking because we have lots of other voices that I know you're really interested in hearing. Um, I'll just say, in terms of the historical information provided, you'll see at the top of that a listing of the previous Board of Education presentations that have been provided. They're available on the district website. What follows that is um, an articulation of the evolution of the expectations outlined by the state of Connecticut. And it, um, they begin in 2002, and you'll see that uh, the state began by defining bullying and um, requiring all districts to have anti-bullying policies. From there, it evolved to um, a, a more explicit uh, outlining of expectations around policy and practices. The requirements um, included reporting, notification, investigation, support, and intervention. Um, and as we often do in New Canaan, we thought long and hard about how we were going to meet all these requirements. And what became really clear to us is that we wanted students to be at the table with us. Um, when we do other kinds of work, we call experts in to work with us and help us. And we do this work recognizing that our students are the experts in their experience of our schools. So we're really um, thrilled with the uh, partnership we have with Dr. Preble, who has helped us work through the student-led collaborative action research model that we're using. And I could talk about it, but it's far better if you hear from, about it from the students. So I'm going to um, click through the talking points, which I think are pretty um, clear. We're going to talk, you're going to hear about the collaborative action-based research model through the conversations with the students. You're going to hear from the East representatives, from the East ambassadors. You're going to hear from the SACS lower division student leadership team. Um, we'll talk a little bit about next steps. And then I say I'm going to talk about school climate resources, but really they're, they're just there for you to look at. I won't talk about them. <laughs> um, the, the most important thing about collaborative action-based research model is that it is about students and adults working together. Um, and together we look at the data, both quantitative and qualitative. We do data analysis and identify issues that we want to deal with. We develop goals around those issues, action planning and implementation, and then go back and look at um, how we're doing through different kinds of progress monitoring. But enough from me. Let me turn on the mic. It's all yours. Hi, my name is Arin King Joseph and I'm in fourth grade. <coughs> East Ambassadors is a group of third and fourth grade students that meet twice each month before school with Mr. Shovelin and Miss Barnes. We have a fall group and a spring group with boys and girls from each third and fourth grade class. We had to fill out an application to be picked for East Ambassadors and show that we were interested in sharing our ideas about eSchool. Hi, my name is Annabelle Rimmer and I'm in fourth grade. East Ambassadors first started last school year. That group of ambassadors met with every class in the school from kindergarten to fourth grade to collect information about what was going well at East and what we could do to make East even better. The ambassadors analyzed the data and found that the students wanted more equipment to use at recess, like balls and hula hoops. So the ambassadors organized Operation Spare Change, and with the spare change from the students at East, they collected enough money to buy more recess equipment. Hi, my name is Lila Volpe, and I'm in fourth grade. This year, our whole school is focusing on empathy. That means how to put yourself in someone else's shoes and do something to show that you care. The East Ambassadors have been making skits about empathy and reporting acts of empathy that we see in the school. We also had a chance to look at the data from some survey questions about empathy that all students took. And we noticed some good news about older students being kind to younger students, but we also noticed we had some work to do. 
Hi, my name is Christian Lord, and I'm in third grade. Our job is to help make East School an even, a, an even better and safer place. East Ambassadors are the eyes and ears for the adults in the school. We see things that are happening when the adults are not around. We talk, to, we talk about how to improve the things we see and hear. We talk to students about about how the things about the things we are trying to change. Hi, my name is. Hi, my name is Tadra Smedley, and I am in third grade. When we analyzed the student data this month, we worked with Mr. Pebble, who let us choose numbers or words to study. Numbers people analyzed the percent of students who gave a certain answer in the survey. Words people read the comments and surveys that students wrote on the surveys. Both groups had lots to share. Now we are going to show you a video clip of our work with Mr. Pebble so you can see for yourself. So I will just say some of the audio is not great. The purpose of this is just to give you a little window into the process, so don't be distressed if you can't hear every word. I was the videographer, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do as good a job as the kids. <laughs> the numbers people please come right over here when the words people that didn't raise their hand go over with keep you have to say that we had to tell us like our students or our students the important things we found is that right it's just based see there's percent of you and look at what it says how many, what's the good answer to the first question? I just want everybody to be happy. Um, the question is, do these students apologize and try to be nicer after they've done something that isn't kind? What's the right answer? What's the good answer? Never or no most of the time. So, so, you, so do you agree that most of the time is good and never be bad? Well, see, that's me. I never apologize. Oh, that's not very good. I never apologize. So what we want you to do is look at your three words that you have to use to make your point. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to look at the first one. Okay? 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 Look so this is, a this is a series of pictures showing the adults working with the students on the data, trying to pick out what's the good news and what's the bad news. Or the not so good news. <laughs> Somebody says, hey, excuse me, what's your name? Olivia, you were looking at the data on from surveys, right? Yes. Um, and did you find some good news in the data? Or is people can you tell us what good news you found? Very nice. 
So that's a little window into the process that um, these students have been um, engaged in. Let's see if I can figure out how to close this and just move on. Ah, and this is, the, I'm always so happy when I can do it. Um, this is a list of the students who are participating in the East Ambassadors program. And next we'll hear from um, the lower division students uh, at Sachs. And, and um, I guess I should just stop and say, I don't know if I said this, I meant to say when I was here in June with the eighth graders, one of the questions that was asked was, how are we gonna expand this work to the younger students? And I guess my response is a little dramatic, but I thought you'd be interested <laughs> in hearing. So, so let's just kind I'm of- switch. Yeah. That would be great. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. My name is Liz Markowitz. Uh, I'm a fifth and sixth grade counselor at Sachs, and I've been there for 11 years. And I have to say that this has been professionally one of the most rewarding experiences working with this group of students. And this is just a representation of the larger group. Uh, they just bring so much energy and enthusiasm, and it's just really been a joy. Uh, so I've been working with the uh, lower division team since last year. Um, we currently have an adult design team that's in place, so it's faculty members that have volunteered to participate in this work. Um, and then we also have our sixth grade team in place. We meet on a weekly basis and work on some of our initiatives, and you'll be able to hear what they have in mind. Um, we're going to be folding in a seventh grade team uh, next month, um, so we'll be kind of bringing them into the loop. Um, and then we still currently have our eighth grade team um, working as well. And then we're going to be bringing on board our fifth grade, our new fifth grade team that will be joining us in March too. So the program will continue to expand. Hello, I'm Kara Doherty from the sixth grade red team. And I will be telling you what the leadership training consists of. The leadership training consists of icebreakers to create openness between the leaders, learning about the change process, work that the eighth graders did last year, opportunity, opportunity to hear others' ideas and opinions, lead without taking over, and encouraging others to become leaders in creating a positive school climate. Hi, I'm Evie Bradley from the sixth grade blue team, and I'm going to be telling you about understanding other, pe other people's perspectives. One of the very important parts of what we are doing is learning to understand other people's perspectives. Our student leadership team is made up of students who sit at different lunch tables representing different friendship groups. So when we meet, there are lots of different ideas, including how people experience school and how they think we can improve it. We learn about other people's perspective by listening to each other and by looking at differences in percentages on the school climate survey. As a result of our conversations, we are becoming friends with different people. Hello, my name is Sophia Ambia, and I'm on the green team in sixth grade. Today I'm here to talk to you about action planning that Dr. Preble helped us create. First, we review the data and results and goals from last year's eighth grade leadership group. Then we select goal groups by rank by rank order of interest and identify priorities of the goal groups we chose. Next, we brainstorm solutions based on our perspectives and analyze pros, cons, and feasibilities of options. We develop action plans with concrete things to do, including small, medium, and big projects. Good evening, my name is Amelie Lenoff, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about the three student-developed goals. Earlier this year, we were broken up into three groups based on, what we were, based on what we strongly believed in. More choices for the students, discipline in school, or respectful relationships. I am from the choices group, and this is what we have decided on as our main goal. Our decided goal was to provide students with more opportunities and choices, creating indoor and outdoor recess options. Hello, out of the three groups, I'm a part of the discipline discipline group. Our goal is to improve the effectiveness of school discipline and explore alternative approaches. We're focusing on consistent rules for the whole school and choices for recess as a positive approach. 
I'm, pa I'm part of um, the relationships group, and our goal is to work to improve respectful relationships between teachers, students, and peers. We are currently focusing on boys treating girls with respect. Hi, I'm Amanda Mohammed. I'm from the sixth grade red team, and I'm here to talk to you about the lower division SLT activities. The lower division SLT team has participated in many activities that have advanced our understanding in school climate and why it's important. Some of the projects we have done in the end of last year and so far this year are transition activities for the fourth graders coming to fifth grade. This includes hosting tours of SACS, visiting the elementary schools to show a video we created about a day in the life of a SACS fifth grader, and answering any questions that the fourth graders had. We also have given tours to the students who are new to New Canaan. Even, we even presented school climate data and goals to the faculty with the upper division student leadership team. Hi, I'm Caroline Vincent from the SAC 6th grade green team. This slide has a few words on it that the students in our program use to describe the leadership team. Some words are fun and friendship, and also like you have your voice and stuff. Um, these are the names of the students who have so far participated in our program this year. We will add 5th and 7th graders on later this year, and it will grow even more for years to come as we bring more students on board. Our main belief in the leadership program is not to be an exclusive group, but to give everyone a chance in, to, to participate in making SACS a better place. So a few words from me. Our next steps is to con are, include continuing the work on action planning, raising awareness, and building interest. We have our next consultation on site with Dr. Preble on March 21st. His team will come down and work with all the students and adults together. Uh, we'll be doing some planning around that in the next couple of weeks during um, the weeks of March 22nd through April 1st, we will be re-administering our school climate survey to all faculty, students in grades three through 12 and their parents. And then in May and June, we'll be analyzing the results of that survey and um, discussing impl implications for any changes to our goals and action plans. The resources that I talked about and as always, we want to thank you for your support of this really important work. And um, I would really love to thank all of uh, the students who have come out tonight. Well, I'd like to echo your thanks to all of you students for coming out tonight. I know on a school night, sometimes that's hard for all of you kids and for your moms and dads. So thank you for all coming out. And we're all, I think I can speak for everyone in saying how impressed we all were with your uh, presentations today. So thank you for giving us a window into what it's like to be a, a fifth grader and sixth graders and fourth graders. Um, so let me um, open it up to any questions from the board. Does anyone have any questions? Sherry? Um, well, I'd also like to echo, I thought that was an excellent job. And I saw you, some of you rehearsing out in the hallway, and you did even better in here. <laughs> I mean, you were clear, articulate, you had good messaging. It was A plus. So I think you all get a homework pass tomorrow, right? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Um, so clearly, um, everything that you're doing is of paramount importance, especially in today's age when there's so much pressure on our kids. And so I applaud you and thank you for, for your efforts. And clearly, you're going well above and beyond all of the state legislation. But I'm just curious, how do you um, communicate with other schools in the collection of best practices? I mean, obviously, this seems like a very unique approach with the collaborative student-led approach. And I'm just wondering. Um, it, it, is that coming from other schools? Are you sharing that with other schools? And how does that exchange work? So that's part of what uh, Dr. Preble and his team has brought to us. And they have worked in other schools, so they're kind of sharing those practices. We have talked about uh, the possibility of doing a summit at some point and having some of our students present in uh, that capacity, working with other schools and sharing the work they've done. 
Can I also share the, uh, this topic around student stress, st school climate and culture for students uh, has been the, probably the top of the agenda for the tri-state consortium that we're a mm -hmm. part of, which is a group of 40 school districts in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And we meet periodically as superintendents to talk about issues facing our schools and we learn from each other about things. And this has been a topic over the last couple of years that has been front and center for us. And so I'm able to share with those the other superintendents in these districts some of what we're doing and hear from them a bit about what they're doing and, and how they're sort of helping to establish the type of environment for our students that we want you know we want them to be in a school where they know that every adult in that building is focused on their success on their them being comfortable ready to learn being in a place where they feel safe and welcomed and uh, and so the we've been able to share some um, ideas around that as well with our like districts in New York, mm -hmm. New Jersey, and New York. Okay. And just one other follow-up question. So how many, in total, how many students are involved as ambassadors or on the leadership team? And then how do you get the students that aren't in those appointed positions kind of equally engaged in this effort? So at SACS, at the eighth grade level, we have about 25 students. And in the lower division, about a similar number. Um, one of the the most important parts of this work is um, having that team of students invite others into the work. So they may not be on the leadership team, but they're participating in the activities and sharing their ideas for how to um, affect the goals we're trying to um, make progress on. At East School, I'm going to And at East, they also had about 15 students last year who are now fifth graders at SACS. So we will be bringing them into the work as well at SACS. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> did you still have a question? I just wanted to compliment, as everybody has done, I, I'm particularly impressed with the idea that you're analyzing and doing research, which is such an effective way to find out how problems, what problems are real which ones are ones that are very important, showed by the math and the statistics that you're putting together. And uh, I was just very impressed with that and wanted to compliment you all on that. Maria? <clears throat> um, I just want to say also what a really great job. You're speaking so well in front of a, a group of people. That's really excellent. Um, I did have a question. When you set the goals, um, for example, having boys show more respect for girls. In what ways do you engage the families on those specific goals? Having a son, <laughs> you know, um, is there an ongoing feedback kind of thing that, that lets parents know this is what's going on and this is how you can help? So what I would say is that as we're um, kind of rolling things forward, we're working toward building greater awareness and that would be one aspect of an action plan, would be how are we going to communicate uh, these things to parents and involve them in the um, improvement in the things that we think need to be improved. I don't know if on that particular question, if Chris, you wanna say, oh, I'm sorry, it was Sachs. Um, so I'll just say <laughs> that uh, that would be a, Thing that we will talk with the students about. We don't have a specific plan at this point for sharing that with parents, but it will be part of the action planning as it, we go forward. It makes forward. good dinner time conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think you're right about that. <laughs> Jen. Um, so I too want to thank you so much for all the work you're doing and all of you guys did a tremendous job. So thank you for all your hard work. You're making our school so much better. Um, quick question. I know on here at Next Steps you're talking about um, the School Climate Survey Administration for students grades 3 through 12. What Can you just, just say what that is again? So um, 
every two years, a minimum of every two years, we have to administer a school climate survey. And so it is an online survey. Uh, we send out a letter. Well, that's probably a little old school. Email. We, yeah, right, yeah. email. And yeah. it's on the website that we are going to be doing the survey. The survey that we are using is um, from the Center for School Climate and Learning. It will be our second administration of that survey. It's online. Right. We um, typically take about a two-week window to get all the students and their families to take the survey and the faculty. And then we get information back. We get the data back from them and go back into our teams to analyze. Right. So another question. So for the high school, like mm -hmm. I know Mr. Egan has been doing such an amazing job, like really, you know, engaging all the kids and getting feedback on like music during passing time and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So are do you have a hand in the high school? Like, are you? So so the work that's been, um, well, I shouldn't even say the work. There's so much work that's been going on at right. the high school, but the work kind of related to this work has um, really taken place mostly through their connections program. Mm -hmm. There is a team of students and faculty who are working on sort of the content of that program. Like and At the high school. At the high school. And it's based on their survey results. So mm -hmm. sort of the themes for that program grew out of their last survey results. And they have activities that really are designed to delve into the areas where they felt they wanted to do some improving. Right. So is that like a club or is it like a leadership? Just because I mean, I'm familiar with the Ambassador Club and I know they're really engaged in the beginning of the year with new students, but right. you know, I've been speaking with people about how we can kind of further that club, making them more engaged throughout the year. Right. I don't know if that's... So the Connections program at the high school is a little different. It is the... the um, latest iteration of their advisory program, their mentoring program, and so students meet in a small group of like 10 to 12 students mm -hmm. with a faculty member, okay. and that is a, a constant, a static group over the four years that the students are there. So okay. the relationships really are given an opportunity to develop, and they can delve into the kind of uh, conversations that we think are important around creating positive school climate along with other things. Okay. Does that explain? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this administration of the survey being the second one will give us some comparative data that we can then use to, to look at with our students and to see we worked in these areas and do we see some growth in these areas and is it what we expect and maybe we need to modify some of our approach in order to address it a little bit differently and uh, maybe there's some other things that have popped up that we didn't see before that we want to work on and that I think that's the the last step and the first step of the action right. research cycle right exactly. as we put all of that together so I think it's it's so exciting for the to hear from each of you as you're going through this cycle and looking at the the results and the data and talking to each other and talking to Dr. Preble and you know sort of working through what your plan's going to be and how you're going to do it and measure it it's really it's really exciting and have you do you want talk about this in some of your other classes do your do your teachers talk about it do you um, does it go beyond just the times when you're when you're together as a group yet and it may not yet, and it's okay to say not yet. <laughs> not yet. And that's probably part of the action plan as you put it all together. Sherry? Um, so I could talk about this all night because I find this so fascinating. But one other question. I, uh, while I love the idea of the student-led goals and empowering the students right. in that way, um, I'm wondering how you validate those goals in that sometimes you know, kids or students don't know what they don't know, so to speak. And, you know, they may, for example, think it's just fine and dandy that they're spending all their time on their phones. Or there may be other, you know, and I'm specifically thinking about social media, but it could be other areas as well where they're not necessarily self-aware or cognizant of um, the issue. And so I'm just wondering how do you work through that process and empower the students to set those goals, but then again have a validation that they are indeed kind of the most prescient issues in the community. 
So I guess what I would say to that is it is like the fine dance of parenting. So you want to mm -hmm. give your child the opportunity to express opinions and sort of think through things with you and you guide them in in ways of looking at something a different way and i think that that is how this process works as well mm -hmm. and, and moving beyond you know what's required in the legislation with bullying and mm -hmm. in, in getting more specifically into cyber billing which which is so hard for a school district to monitor mm -hmm. um, is there anything built into your process where, whereby you're assessing that risk? And if so, how do you do that? Well, I think that is one of the really um, important ways that having students at the table makes such a tremendous difference because they live in the world that we're talking about more than we do. And so raising those conversations and having um, information from them is really helpful. Um, in order to make some uh, good decisions mm -hmm. about how we do action planning around that. Right. Okay, thank Can you. Can I just add something to that, Nora? Um, just in reflecting back on spending some time with, uh, with our students from eSchool a couple of weeks ago and thinking about the really basic skills that are embedded in this work that can really be translated not only to the technological aspect of it, but just in terms of how they respond and react to one another. To hear third graders talking about what empathy is, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, I was awesome. I was awestruck. <laughs> I was awestruck by the fact of, you know, seeing them talk about what empathy is and how it translates into their day and what it means. And, you know, multiply that times 25 or 30 other adjectives that they're talking about in terms of uh, good interpersonal relationships and you know how your 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 level of civility and and those all of those skills that they're talking about and becoming uh, more aware of in the school community I'm sure they are at home as well and how that translates out into the world is just you know uh, a very basic skill that can be applied in a variety of places so you know if they understand how important it is to think about how someone else is feeling about what you're saying, um, then, then there's, you know, your technological piece, so. It's big work. Anyone else? Penny? Again, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for the tremendous work and for taking ownership and leadership in creating an environment working with your teachers and your administration. I think it's extremely um, impressive. And one of the things I was wondering, with the focus that we've really had on anti-bullying in the state of Connecticut with all the legislation and all the efforts that uh, New Canaan and other schools have undertaken in the last 10 years, are there any um, metrics or any data to show if the incidence of um, how that has affected school climate, if the incidence of bullying has gone up or down? I, mean, I know there's been so much more social media. It's not like it's a stagnant world, but I was wondering what the experts were saying. I think it is a, um, th there definitely are measurements out there in terms of state reporting. Um, it's hard to say, is it improving? Because even one situation makes you feel like there's not enough improvement, if you know what I mean. Right. So um, I certainly could look and get you some statistics in terms of what sort of uh, reporting is happening in the from the districts in Connecticut um, but I would say we're going to keep working at this indefinitely even if the numbers can go down because we just want to make sure that everybody's feeling safe and um, comfortable in our schools and it does stand to reason that the more dialogue that our students are having and our staff and our administration are having about these issues, um, whatever the measurement shows, the better off we are. Um, oh, ab absolutely. And so, you know, I think that over the last, I would say five years, but uh, three years of deeper work, um, I, I think that there's been so much more dialogue. There's been so much more discussion in our schools. There's so much more of an awareness of all of the skills um, that are embedded in the work that, um, you know, I, I think our measurement is our survey 
um, and looking at the data that comes back from that this time and comparing that against the last time, as Dr. Lutze said. But um, it, I think it can help but impact um, our schools, uh, which nationally is an important thing, but uh, you know what, what's important to us is what's happening in our schools. And we also um, yearly have to do an ED 166 report, which is a, di a discipline report. So we have to submit our verified acts of bullying as part of that report, and that's part of um, the state responding to the federal government and how they're doing in response to school climate and. So the state is slightly behind on their publication of all those documents, um, but it is something that we do report yearly to the state. And um, you know, once all the data does get published, um, it gives us an idea of where we stand in relationship to other districts in the state of Connecticut. Right. And I just just to piggyback a little bit, I think equally important is for all the students, all of our students, to know if they see something or experience something that's not right that there are lots of adults in school, there are parents at home, others who would like to hear about that, who want to hear about that, who they can tell and they can trust. And I think that you know, in, in this work, a lot of the, the focus is also on that. So helping students to recognize things that maybe shouldn't be happening between each other and between students. And then knowing that they can talk to the adults in school, they can talk to their teachers, their principals, their counselors, others about what's going on and that uh, we're all here to help them and to help solve the problems. I think that's, that's equally as important. So as we do work like this, sometimes the numbers could even go up a little because now we're more aware of things that have been going on that we weren't aware of before because our students now are, are able to tell us and they're able to recognize these things and they know that we're here, we're here to help them and to um, you know, work through whatever issues might come up. And there's also a, a documentation process that's required now in terms of the reporting piece for the bullying, which Nora and I monitor. So um, we can actually look at what's in the reporting in terms of what issues arise and how much reporting there is. Uh, and the implications of the volume of that kind of answers the, uh, the data question. Okay, well, I think um, I'd like to thank Ms. Daly, Ms. Margowitz, Ms. Bolli for um, bringing all the students here today. Thank all of you for coming and, um, and just remind you how important the work that you're doing is and to you know, communicate with your friends and other colleagues about, or other kids in your school <laughs> about, about what you're doing because it, it is really important. It's important to all of us. It's important to Dr. Lutze. It's important to the entire administration. And um, it'll make your schools better. So um, thank you for coming. And thank you, parents, for bringing all your kids out tonight. And get home and do your homework. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's right. I don't give homework passes. No. <laughs> Our schools are lucky to have leaders like you. Thank you all for stepping up and doing this to help your schools. Thank you. So, and the first day back from break, and they come yeah. out, and then that good for them. We get a good night's sleep. All right. Well, moving on. Um, the next item on our agenda is the school uh, is the budget update. So I think I'm looking at the correct. Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Lutze. Yes, and I had um, I put this on our agenda on, your, on the board's agenda tonight, just as a, a placeholder, so I can just give a quick update on where we are with our budget process with the town and. If there are any questions or anything, sort of follow up from the board as well. Um, the and I know that many of you, those of you that are able to, have been going to the meetings with the board of finance. Uh, but since we have, we weren't able to hold our meeting two weeks ago. I thought a, a, just a very quick update would be helpful as well. We have um, we've been going after the joint meeting with the town council and board of finance. We've been meeting with the board of finance 
Uh, we did not have a meeting last week, thanks to the vacation, uh, but we had met with them prior to that um, a couple of times. And in the meeting, uh, the most recent meeting, we had received questions from the Board of Finance in advance, around 30 questions or so, and I'd answered, through, answered those questions pretty thoroughly. Those are available on our website. Uh, and the questions ranged really from um, small things around, smaller things and larger things, you know, sort of. Um, the Board of Finance took a very close look at our budget, and I think thanks to the um, clarity of the budget presentation this year, they're really able to understand it quite well, um, but also asked um, asks some very thoughtful and meaningful questions for us. Uh, we had quite a bit of discussion around our staffing needs as we've put them together. Uh, we had quite a bit of discussion around uh, positions. We spoke a bit about our special education, uh, the, uh, the administrative position that's there. Um, and I, I do believe, and we talked quite a bit about um, sort of turnover in the budget uh, and what that delta is as we look back over, the, over four years. Uh, I think, well, again, all the, all the specific questions and information is there. But um, the, I, I believe feedback from the Board of Finance has been positive. Uh, I believe that they left the meeting feeling that we were thorough in responding to the questions and available, you know, as they asked follow-up questions, able to sort of get into that dialogue with them. Um, we do have a meeting tomorrow night with the Board of Finance again. Um, I spoke with the, our first selectman today to see if there were any questions in advance of that meeting. Uh, at this point, we don't have any, which I think is a good sign. I think it's a sign that we were very thorough in our first round going through. Uh, I anticipate a few may come up between now and then, which is fine, and if not, we'll still be at the meeting tomorrow night, um, prepared to continue the discussion together and um, to you know, look, hear more from the Board of Finance of their input and share you know, the board's thinking and developing the budget that we have before us. Uh, the Thursday night is the, um, the vote. So Tuesday night's a public hearing and more conversation. And then Thursday night is vote from the Board of Finance um, and, uh, and a regular meeting for them after that. Um, so after this week, the Board of Finance should be concluded with their phase of the budget. And then it transitions to the town council. Uh, Wednesday of next week, I think it's the second, is our, our meeting with the town council where I would anticipate, again, we'll have some questions in advance that we prepare, uh, and then we'll go as the, the whole team will go again, uh, prepared to answer any questions that may come up. So we are, uh, it was nice to, to have a week to catch our breath a little bit last week and thoughtful of the town not to schedule budget meetings during that break. So I would want to publicly thank them for that as well. Um, but now we're ready to dive back in and continue the, the dialogue with them. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I'd just like to start out and um, thank Dr. Lutze and Dr. Keating and um, because I think they're underplaying the um, compliments they're getting on the budget presentation that they put together. Um, you know, it, it is very detailed and um, I think, you know, they're still diving through all the detail and trying to, trying to figure it out, but um, I think that the amount of work and effort that's been expended by um, the board, you know, the board of education on on behalf of the district has been remarkable. So, um, I think we should all be, you know, very appreciative of their efforts. Um, let me let me open it up to questions first, and then Penny. So I was uh, happened to be able to be there at the meeting, which was great, and there was uh, I thought it was very productive and a good discussion. I guess one of the things that uh, concerned me, and I just wanted to get feedback from the administration, is there was a lot of discussion about what the turnover and the retirements would be of the teachers, and uh, how much funding uh, the town bodies might take out of the budget to do that, and th there seemed to be a little bit of an averaging impact, uh, and I was wondering. That struck me as particularly problematic for the Board of Ed, you know, in terms of our hiring, which is if we don't get as many retirements as they anticipate, and we've only, I don't, how many do we have now today? A couple. A couple. Um, then we may not be able to hire the teachers that we need to during the summer. And there was some thought about going back to the town bodies to restore funds to the budget. Uh, but I think that that seems like a cumbersome project that might in actually, uh, in addition to taking administrator time, actually impede um, education. I've been in this uh, board when we've had to freeze the budget as early as December. And, uh, 
you know, having been through discussions with town bodies about adding funds to the budget, I know it's never an easy process. So I was wondering if maybe you could give us a little bit more color, a little bit more fact um, as to why that uh, should not be an average number. It should be sort of like the lowest number anticipated or something, you know, what, what information you might add. Sure. And I'll add some, and Joanne, feel free to jump in as we go. Um, we did have quite a bit of discussion about that, as you're saying, Penny. And one of the things that came to note as we took a look, we looked back over four years to see what the numbers were around retirements. And it ranged anywhere from two teachers retiring in one year, I think, to about a dozen. It might have been um, one or two more. I, I don't have that right in front of me. But there was a wide range. And as the you know, we, we did do some averaging just to have a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about savings. And you know, the average savings between a retiring teacher and, and the replacement teacher over that span of time was, it was approximately $36,000 per individual teacher. And that's, again, that is averaging. So there's certainly, there were some that were more and some that were less depending upon the market because it really, hiring teachers is going out to the market. We're looking for, we're looking at the pool. We're looking for the best person we can find. Um, there are some districts that um, will only hire out a, a brand new teacher out of college. We're not one of those districts. I think we're very fortunate. We attract talented folks with experience. And uh, you know, in some of the positions that are open sometimes, the, the only people available might, be, might have 25 years experience. You know, the, the, maybe you're in advanced science or sometimes more language teachers and others where we are actively recruiting in, in a very shallow pool. Um, one of the, the discussions at the Board of Finance I meeting was also about, you know, can you trend line the number of retirements? Um, there were some questions around, is there a mandatory retirement age? Um, how do you know, you know, can you, can you figure this out over time? And looking at, again over the four years and just the range of from two to 12 or 14 or so, um, you know, we really, they made the determination and we've, we agree and have said the same thing that it's very difficult to, you really can't create a trend line around this. There is no mandatory retirement age for teachers. Um, and for that, I'm, I'm thankful because we've got some of our teachers have been here a while and do an outstanding job. And they have so much um, institutional and organizational knowledge that, um, you know, they're stars. So they, and they love to teach and they want to be here for, we want them to be here for as long as they want to be here. You know, so it works out well. It's a win-win for sure. Um, the, so as we looked at it, it is difficult to, it, impossible to create a trend line. Um, the, we did in this budget anticipate uh, some savings through retirement uh, already in the budget that was presented out. And that was about $100,000. It was $100,000 that we reduced the salary request in anticipation of, you know, really about three retirements. Um, at the, you know, it's $36,000 per, so I'm saying about. You know, is again, that's the average, but it's not a science, you know, because of the, it all depends on the retiree, the retiree and the available pool and the best person in that pool to take the spot. And there have been times, so you know, that we have opened up a position, we posted, we brought in our applicants and we found that no, nobody in that pool was uh, of the quality that we were looking for and we've reposted and gone back out and looked again. You know, this is, you know, we are hiring folks that we anticipate be here for a long time and, and work closely with our students. Um, so we, we work very hard to only hire the very best. Um, that's, uh, you know, sometimes it works that there's a, a large savings between and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so as we, we did anticipate that in the budget that's in front of you, that's $100,000. Uh, the, you know, the, I'm sure there'll be conversation tomorrow night about more. Uh, last year there was a reduction of about $250,000 250, from the salary line from the Board of Finance. Uh, we had an unusual year in the number of um, departures from the district that helped us. Uh, the, so I, I, I'm not sure, you know, as we all will have to go into that conversation with them tomorrow night. Um, a bit, but it is important, you know, the, the discussion around sort of limiting it, bringing it down to a, a low number and then having the Board of Education come back. I think it's important to know, uh, there was a su surprise for the, many of the folks, I think, on the Board of Finance when they asked us, what do we do if people move into the district after we've started, you know, how do we hire those teachers? You know, as we, if we're, let's say it's October and we have seven first graders move in that pushes us over the class size guidelines. You know, how do we hire that person? 
And the answer was we don't. You know, our hiring is all done. It's very intense and it's done in the summertime so that we are prepared as we go into the new year. We're not typically then hiring teachers and breaking up classes in order to maintain you know, class size guidelines or things like that. So we really, it, it, we need to have um, some, the ability to be responsive to changing conditions in the moment. You know, we can't um, put off hiring a teacher, let's say, for two months that we need due to class sizes and then have the, the funding come through so that we can then hire that teacher in October because we're not going to be breaking up other classes and bringing students out of the room where they've been working with their teacher and establishing the rapport and getting to know the teacher's been learning about that student and you just wouldn't do that you know, in a school. So it really is, is the period of the summer that those conditions can change very quickly and the, we, the ability to be responsive to those changing conditions uh, in order to best serve our, our students and our community is vital you know, for us. There are also uh, needs can arise as we go through the school year. You know, and again, those things, sometimes they are um, incredibly timely. As we go, we can think just back to this year with our, uh, the oil tanks. You know, where we had a, a small window of opportunity to make the, the repairs and changes with the oil tanks that we had at two of our schools in order to get that work done and open school on time. Um, if we had to wait in order to go back to the town and ask for the, the funding and not be able to you know, sort of make it work within our budget, um, I, I believe we would have, we, I don't know that we could have done that. You know, and we are, I think it's important to always remember that we've over 4,000 students, 700 plus staff, over 900,000 square feet of building. Um, you know, and we have only 182 days to educate our students. So our, the ability to be responsive to changing conditions is, is vital for our successful operations. And I think that, um, well, I, I have some concern around some of that conversation uh, of reducing the budget to a degree where we would be, the Board of Education would be going back uh, if, those, if the conditions change. Because in an environment, uh, in a school environment of this size and magnitude and you know, in an 80 plus million dollar budget as we're running things through, I think uh, things do change. And to be best able to serve our students and community, I think we, we need some degree of flexibility and being responsive to those conditions. So if I could just add oh, a few yeah. things. To yeah. you. I think it's important for um, the boards to recognize um, the last point that uh, Brian was making, and that you know probably 97 percent of our budget is uh, fairly, um, I won't say easy, but we have the ability to um, gauge those projections based on position control, history, our needs, our programs, and so forth. But that other two to two and a half percent, which is two million dollars approximately is variable and it goes both ways. We can save money in turnover savings and we can spend money in facilities or special education, legal fees. There's a number of different ways that we can have more needs. Um, and so there has to be a way to balance that. And it's within that very few percentage of our $85 million budget request for next year that we can do that. So I think that's the conversation we're gonna to wanna to have with the town officials and the ability to react to our needs is very important. So I'm hoping that we can get them to that point tomorrow. You know, turnover savings is a conversation that I've engaged in in all the districts I've been in pretty much because it is a moving target and years where you do have a lot of savings, it's very attractive in the next year to say, oh geez, we could have another year like that. But chances are that might not happen and you will find yourself in a difficult position if it doesn't. Hazel? I just wanted to compliment you all in the way that you answered those questions because I feel that, and, and it is available for people to read online those, and I think that it would be certainly uh, helpful to the community and communication if people would go and look at those questions and the answers because uh, they're very easy, easy to understand, and uh, you don't have to be an accountant. It's very, but it gives you a lot more information about education and why, and the behind, and the reasons for it. So I think it would be helpful for people to read that, read them, and go over. I was very impressed when I was reading those. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Um, I just like to make a few comments um, because I was at the meeting as well, and um, I. I think it's important for everyone to understand that the Board of Ed's budget 
doesn't have a contingency fund. So as Dr. Keating said, you know, it's, we have no place to go but within the budget to find those emergency items that we need to fund during the year. Um, and I'm sure we'll see some incidents of, of that. You know, we see our account statements monthly and, and you see how we need to sometimes make transfers within accounts and, and we have that ability and that's, you know, it's, it gives Dr. Lutze and his staff a lot of flexibility in being able to address the needs of the district at the time that those needs occur. So I think it's an important thing. Um, I think it's also important for everyone on the board to understand, and I think it's important for the public to understand that the legislature was very deliberate in not giving um, the town bodies um, line item control over the Board of Ed's budget. Um, you know, that was done for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I think we need to understand that it's, you know, Dr. Lutze and his staff are the experts in education. We all, you know, I think we, we need to look to experts to build budgets on what they know. And I think in this town, Dr. Lutze and his staff are, are the experts on education. And we should look to those experts to, to provide, you know, the, bu the budget that we, that he thinks he needs. And, and, you know, I think everybody should also understand that, you know, the money that does or doesn't get spent during the year is, is goes back to the town. It actually never comes to the Board of Ed. It always sits in the town and we only, um, money is distributed from a town's account to pay all of the Board of Ed's bills at the time that they come through. If the Board of Ed does not spend that money on an educational um, basis, which has to come through a warrant from the town's finance department, you know, or from the, you know, the Board of Ed, you know, issues a warrant to the town to pay something. If that doesn't happen, money doesn't get transferred out of the town's account. So, you know, I think we, I pe people really need to understand that because I think, you know, they think we're holding on to money and we don't. It's, it's only for educational purposes. And so I think, you know, we're, we need to be clear about that. Um, and I, I think we also need to understand that we don't want our superintendent and our staff to be spending the entire year working on the budget. You know, Dr. Ludsey is an educational expert. We hired him to run our school district. And while he's very capable at budgeting and forecasting and financial modeling, um, we, we didn't hire him to do that. We hired him to run our schools and educate our kids. And if we put the Board of Education or Dr. Ludsey in a position to constantly have to be going back to the town bodies to ask for funding, he's not focusing on what he was hired to do. And I think people are losing sight of that, you know, saying, oh, well, you just come back. It won't be a big deal. I mean, the amount of time and effort this board spent trying to get our insurance money or our, you know, excess cost grant money last year. Um, well, it, you know, I think it's important to say it may seem like a small thing to other bodies. It's a huge thing to this group when we want it to be focused on educating our kids. So enough said on that. Penny? So I just wanted to add from having watched the budget process a number of years that the concept of going, having to go back in the fall when we spend so much of the, uh, basically starting in October and then the school administration is working on the budget prior to that from October through April, we're really fully focused on it. I don't think it would be a good place for this district to go. Um, I think that any funds that would get approved that you would need for hires, it generally is at least a two-month process. You have to go through the boards, then you have to go through the waiting period. It uh, takes away uh, the nimbleness of the administration to respond to the changing needs of the, the students. And so I just I look forward to a constructive conversation with the members of the uh, town bodies on this. And I also wanted to say that uh, because of the excellent financial reporting that we've developed over the last few years, we are reporting to the, the, the town, members of the town bodies get a report every month. So if they see something and, and, and the way that we're now accruing salaries throughout the year, if there is a big disconnect, if there is something that looks like uh, we over budgeted or uh, you know, it, there's something that looks a little askew, this is something, you know, we, we're reporting all the information. We can have a conversation to uh, all better understand it. So it's uh, information that the boards have. If, if we don't go to this, it's not as if they don't have a lot of information about what we're doing. 
Can I, can I ask a question? Sure, Tom. Where do we stand right now this year as far as the delta between um, salaries, you know, as far as retirements, the dollar amount, not the amount of teachers that are retired, but the, the money we've saved as far as retirements. In this current fiscal this year? This current fiscal year. It was um, around 600000 if 600, I recall correctly. Okay, next year, 100000 Right, next year we've redu we reduced this budget request by $100,000, uh, anticipating retirements. Okay. But Tom, a few years ago, it was 70000 So, you know, you can't just look at this most current year right. and say, right we should continue that as an assumption. Right. So you have to look at, we could have zero retirements next year. We, we just don't we know. We could have zero, sure. Yeah. We had three, two, three years ago or four right. years ago. There were two. So I think that's I think that's what people have to be mindful of is it's not a trend. Right. You know, retirements are not a trend, you know, unless, you know, we had some major legislative action that may have created a short-term trend. But, um, but other than that, I think, you know, it just, it, it's it's a bit random and and you know when you, if you miss if you miss it's it will directly impact programming in the schools or you know hazel I, I, I wish i brought with me the questions that i was just talking about how impressed i was because one of the things that i think i saw and i need you all to make sure that i read it and understood it correctly was that if we look at our what we have as our guidelines for the classrooms and the number of students that we have in each of them it looked to me as if that um, really a, a somewhat small number, if a small number of students came in more than what we've got the classes assigned to, we really need to expand very quickly on the numbers of teachers we would have to hire. And I think that that's something that, again, is uh, part of what we're talking about, is that you have to have a little bit, if we have that, we don't have a crystal ball. I wish we did, and it would really save a lot of time. But we do not know on October 1st what's, how many kids will we be counting. So that we have to make some sort of leeway to make sure that if we're on the border of those class sizes going into a larger class or a new class, we have to have the money to be able to, buy, to, be able to hire new teachers. I think that's an excellent point, Hazel, because the um, part of the conversation was about, uh, you know, again, the enrollment projections and the staffing. And if we had just done a, a sort of a straight line, except mm -hmm. the projections as they came in, we would have, there'd be two additional teachers in this budget request, right? Mm -hmm. So we also use some, what we called enrollment variability adjustments, um, which really is kind of, is this a little bit. <laughs> um, but the, you know, we, we believe based on our experience that we'll be okay, but a few students can tip the scale one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the board would, we'd come back to the board and have to make some tough decisions around you know, sort of where that, that funding comes from as well. Mm -hmm. So with the, I guess it's important to note, with the $100,000 salary reduction based on anticipated retirements and the um, enrollment variability adjustment, removing two teachers from the request, mm -hmm. we've really tried to already factor in some of these things in the budget that's in front of people now. So you know, I know people, they're looking at it and they're going to make some final decisions and sort of how it all plays out. But also just to note, we didn't, just put forward sort of straight line projections all the way. We did try to factor in a couple of things in order to bring some savings to the table as well prior to bringing the board the budget forward to the Board of Education. So that's, would that be fair to say that's really about 230,000 that we've already taken out for quote turnover or variability when you combine those sure. two? Salary wise, yes. Yeah, salary, salary wise. Plus the 100,000, sure. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I guess there's no such thing as a brief budget discussion this time of year, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to the statement of accounts. Uh, Dr. Keating. Thank you. So before you tonight, you have the statement of accounts through the end of January. It has been reconciled with the town, um, so our records do agree. Uh, I'd like to point out to you that I've made a few changes to clarify things within the report. And they deal with the last two columns on the right-hand side. As you may recall, previously it said remaining balance. I've changed that to anticipated, and I think I'm going to add the word expended, expended uh, to that, because that, that remaining balance 
is part of projected expenditures. It just hasn't been encumbered yet. So there's a number of items that are not conducive to encumbering before you actually have a commitment. The, the term encumber really means you have a solid commitment to spend money. So for things that are uh, paid by timesheet, for example, for stipends, for substitute teachers, for utility bills, for those types of items that are not quantifiable and um, reasonable to put on an encumbrance, they remain open right now. So of our $83 million budget this month, 5,870,000 is not encumbered. It doesn't mean we're gonna, not going to spend it. In fact, we anticipate spending most of that with the exception of um, 822,000 now, but um, it has not been encumbered. And as we go through towards the end of the year, that number will be reduced likely as we pay bills. Um, I continue to monitor all the accounts every month as we do the report. So as we get towards the end of the year, if we see some accounts for like substitute teachers and those kind of things that aren't materializing, that would go into the unallocated category possibly. But this is where we stand right now. As you recall, when we prepared the forecast for the budget, okay. uh, the unallocated balance at that time was 973,692. There have been two areas of the special education budget that require funding, so you have transfers um, out of that account right now in the report this month, tuition out of district, there's 121,626 that we need for known uh, placements and commitments, and 29,994 in contracted services for special education as well for known services. I will add that under tuition out of district, we do anticipate additional requirements. We recently received notification from one of our facilities um, out of state that they had a rate increase approved by their state, which was significant. And I know that you're working on that, Dar, but we do anticipate having to pay, I, I would say, a good portion of that. And then lastly, I just wanted to bring to your attention that um, as we went through the budget, and we're really kind of combing through all the accounts to see where people have been charged to make sure that they were charged correctly, there was a piece of our driver bus monitor um, salaries that had been coded on timesheets uh, to teaching assistants. I've made that correction, so you're going to see kind of a flip between um, those two accounts. Um, no reduction in expenditures, just a reclassification to where they had been budgeted. Other than that, uh, there's very little other changes. Thank you, Dr. Keating. Does anyone have any questions? Just, Joanne, could you just um, explain the percent anticipated to be expended, just what that column is? Sure. Um, that includes um, the 822072 going back to the town. So I would just qualify that, which is about 1% um, of our total budget, 20% um, of this total number here. Um, but all other numbers um, involve the accounts that have not been encumbered. So again, I'll speak to the substitute teachers, tutors, um, hourly time um, people, our utilities, um, those sort of things that um, retirement supplement, our payroll taxes are a big part of that number as well, almost $900,000. So if I read across the salaries line, just to understand it, the um, essentially it's 4.03% is anticipated to be expended. Does that mean that 96% is either spent or encumbered? Of the salary account, correct. Of that, of that line, and yes. going to the benefits, it means that essentially 92% are spent or encumbered, and you can just go down that way, right? 81% of contracted services are already spent or encumbered, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. And things like supplies and equipment, they're really encumbered as needed. We don't encumber supplies and equipment in the beginning of the year for the entire year. You, you basically encumber them as you're consuming. So that's why you see some larger percentages there. Okay. Any question? Well, I just want to thank you again for this report. And um, not to beat a dead horse, getting back to the budget, but um, you know, as, as we see just in one month, um, we're having to tra transfer money within accounts for you know, uh, our purchase services account and, and our uh, Contract, if I can read that right, contracted services. So those were unanticipated expenses 
from last year's budget that needed to be found somewhere in, in this year's budget. And, and so we needed that flexibility. So I think it's just, and, and I know we had one of those transfers early in the year related to some oil or some oil lines or something at the, at the elementary school. So, you know, we have old facilities. We, we have lots of kids, so anyway. Over 900,000 square feet. Yeah. So, so one thing just to add to that is that with position control and our ability to really budget down to the person, um, our budget calculations for salaries going forward into next year and the projection for this year are pretty cl close to actual. I mean, if somebody's on a leave, we'll have some money left. If we have to bring people in for a couple extra hours, you can, it's going to cost you a few dollars. So some flexibility in prior calculations that you know, for salaries is not going to be carrying forward into future years. So that's kind of a conversation we've had internally in terms of our own concerns that even that flexibility is now gone. So as we move forward, like we said before, with our conversations with the town, we have to really put all these issues out on the table so they understand where we're coming from. So I think all, all that, all the um, time and effort and expense in transitioning to the MUNA system, the benefits of that system are being recognized this year. We just need to bring the town bodies along to understand that, you know, where they thought they had, you know, money to play with before, it doesn't really exist anymore because, you know, the budgeting that, that's being done is so much more specific. So, anyway. Any other questions? Penny? So, so, so based it's in the budgeting process. In the budgeting process, when we look at the budget and we look at this type of report for next year, mm -hmm. um, an unallocated line, how, how large would we expect that to be next year? I know that we've moved, now that we moved to position control and all that. Or do you not know? No, you know, really, you don't know at this know. at this point in time right now. That's it. Really comes about through the reforecasting process after your staffing is in place, right? Okay. And after your hiring <coughs> is complete, that's when you really are able to to go and dive in. And during the summer, your maintenance projects come up, so you have those right. behind you. So as you move into the fall, you have a much better handle on where you're going to be towards the end of the year. But that's not to say right. a surprise can't come up. Okay. But what, <clears throat> what you do know, if you lose a 25-year employee a week before the budgeting process begins, you can use, use position control to rebudget that at, mm -hmm. a, at another dollar amount, which you may have not been able to do in the past. You might have just thrown that 25-year salary in the budget and projected that as part of your, your next year's budget. That won't be the case going forward. So mm -hmm. it's going right. to be a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. So I guess move on to the action items se uh, section of the agenda. Uh, the first item in the action items is the 2017-18 school calendar, mm -hmm. second read. Um, we have a motion on the table to approve the proposed 2017-18 school calendar as first moved and seconded by Mr. Hayes and Ms. West respective, respectively on December 7th, 2015. Do we have any discussion on that motion that's on the table? Maria? Well, I wanted to bring up Columbus Day. <laughs> um, I think that that day off, that, that year, 2017, that's the year we don't have the Rosh Hashanah's in September. Um, I just think back to that year when it was that long stretch. You know, the kids are just getting into the uh, back into the groove of school, and it was kind of nice to have that, um, you know, traditional holiday off. And I know we're following the other schools, but there's also a lot of, you know, private schools that, that do have the day off. So, you know, I just wanted to have a conversation about that and see what people thought. You know, ideally, I was thinking we could get feedback from families. Um, I mean, I know people that would like that, would like, ha like to have input on that. So, I don't know, what's everyone think? Any, anyone have a comment? So, if I know, Jen. I know you're proposing, or that's an idea. Yeah, so what, like what day do we have that we would? Sure, I can, and I can frame that if that's mm -hmm. all right. Um, the, as you know, we're, we're required to follow the regional calendar, but they do give us the five flex days. So if you have the calendar in front of you, uh, I can speak to sort of how those five flex days are used. <coughs> um, 
four of them are used in February. So those are the four days from the 20th to the 23rd so that we have our week-long break in February. And having just had that last week, I will fight to protect that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Me too. The, the fifth day, um, currently, in the, in the calendar you have in front of you, is Friday, April 6th. And that day um, is the fifth flex day. The next week is the week off in the regional calendar, so that's fine. What we were looking to do there was following the Board of Education policy that asks where possible to try to have the Friday off prior to a week break. So that 6th of April was going to be a professional learning day for staff and a day off for students. Um, the, so that keeping the February days, I think the decision or the conversation is around um, Columbus Day in 2017 is October 9th. And so I guess what I'd ask you know, the board to consider in the conversation is sort of that Friday, April 6th day or the uh, October 9th day of Columbus Day, we would swap those days as a professional learning day or a school day. So if we were to move it uh, to the October 9th day and have Columbus Day off, that would become a professional learning day for staff and students would have school on Friday, April 6th. So I think because that's the fifth day, I think that's sort of your dis the decision point for the board. Sherry? So just, I, the, I think the natural question there would be from an, from an educator's standpoint, what is the value of having a professional learning day on October 9th at the beginning of the school year versus April 6th? Can turn it over to Dr. Carinti if you like. Um, you know, obviously, when we map out our professional learning days, we try to space them out throughout the course of the year. Um, and so that gives teachers an opportunity so that we do not need to do like the embedded learning. It allows us to do that full day learning um, for the teachers. So to spread it throughout the course of the year is always helpful. Um, we do have a professional learning day in August, and then we do have another one in November. And then the next professional learning day doesn't hit until February. Um, and then after that, it's April, and then we hit the end of the school year. So the April date is a nice way for us to spread it out. Um, but obviously, um, you know, we always make our days most productive whenever we have professional learning. So if it turns out to be October 9th, then we would make that a very productive day for staff, um, just as much as we would make April 8th a productive day. Any other comments, questions? Penny? By way of board history, uh, I just know that it was, uh, wasn't was lightly that the board created the policy to try and add the extra day to the weekend, uh, that that was something that we got a lot of feedback from parents that they liked. So giving up to April 6th would be, uh, you know, something that some parents wouldn't, would uh, not enjoy. I mean, it's all these uh, discussions are always hard because you yeah. make some people happy and, and others not. But I would say that that was, something that the board arrived at after a lot, going through a lot of different um, uh, vacation uh, schedules and, and talking to parents. Just, can I just add one, oh, sure. one, one just, just another factor for consideration in the yeah. discussion, if that's all right? Because um, Penny's mentioned it, so it just came to mind. Um, the, in this calendar, there are five days built in in June for uh, if there were snow days or other issues, um, meaning that the, there's that last, that third week in June, the third full week, and by policy, the school can go, schools can stay open through the end of the third full week in June. Um, we have had times in the past where we have had more than that, or we've gone, would have gone past that third week, and in which case we have to take days, uh, either reduced from 182 to 100 days, 180 days, or take days from the April break. Um, so if, if the sixth day were to stay, as a professional learning day and we needed to cut into the April break, that would be the first day that would be taken back and that would be turned into a student day. Um, without the six, it would go into the, the following week that we would take the days back. It doesn't happen often, but it did happen a couple of years ago. Years ago. Yeah. You probably all remember. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it was two days in April that we had to take the days back. Um, it was because I think of Hurricane Sandy which we hope was a 100-year storm, and we don't see anything like that again. But uh, we can't be certain. You know, so just so that you know, um, we would not, typically February is too early. You, don't, you haven't had all of your snow days yet or whatever, so you're not taking out of February. So it really does come out of April if you need, need those days. Just as another point, it just came to mind. How many did you say were built into June? 
There are five days uh -huh. because we could, this calendar in this year, we could go until Different June 22nd. Oh, well. yeah. So mm -hmm. Kirkwood Plaza would be the best, the third. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so we've, we've just, stuck with that. Do you, do you um, want to say and then we've reduced from 182 to 180. So that would, mm -hmm. that's the seven days. And then if it had gone beyond that, we have to take days out of the, mm -hmm. the break. Sherry. So I was just going to make a comment also just for everyone's consideration. And it, just in the, pa in the past, we actually have surveyed parents, so to speak. But I think what we've always come back with is what Penny said, is that you kind of, every, you know, it kind of splits 50-50. People have different preferences. I can tell you there's probably a lot of people who would fight to say, you know, start school after, use the flex day to start school later um, or to end school earlier or, and, so I'm just saying that's why we don't always go every time we approve a calendar, why we don't go out and survey parents because we have done that in the past and have found that it's very split in terms of it's a very you know personal preference. If you ski, you want the February break. If you don't ski, you, you don't want February break. You'd, you'd rather us not use the flex days there. So there's just there's just so many different personal preferences, and I think ultimately we have to make the best decision for our district for you know, the education of our students, where we get the best pace with our students, where you know where the um, professional learning days are best placed. I mean, those are the things that I think as a district we should be really focused on. I'd just like to add, um, you know, because I, I did a little uh, research on, because I, I think some people look back to a few years ago when we had a really long stretch between, um, you know, it was like two, ten, 10 weeks or eight weeks or something between uh, breaks for the kids. That, that occurred in 2013-14 when there was no late, um, I think it was Yom Kippur's late in the September, there was no weekday holiday, so the kids didn't get off that, that at the end of September. And they also didn't get off election day because for some reason it was not, uh, we didn't need we to close to, this. We tried to have we tried election day. Right. We tried taking that day yeah. Right. We're not and, that right. So, <laughs> so, um, so I think some parents remember a really, really long stretch and it was difficult. But if you look at this calendar, we, we do have a break at the end of September for Yom Kippur, I assume. And then we do have a professional learning day on election day. Um, and so they're really only going a month between breaks. And, and as I look at it if uh, this is something I always noticed because it was a little bit disjointed for me as a parent where you'd have you know Rosh Hashanah off then you'd have a week on and then you'd have Yom Kippur off and then you'd have a week on and then you have Columbus Day off and it's like you know every other week the kids were having a day off of school and it it kind of and, and then you go have these big long stretches at the end of the year so I just felt like it was a little bit um, you know difficult but I for, yeah, for teachers and for kids. You know, um, are we going to school or are we not? When do we have a full week? Um, and then I, I, I would like to echo Dr. Lutze's comment is that, you know, we've been knock wood. We've been lucky so far this year. But the last two years, we've had to use lots of snow days. And you only know about those snow days in February and March and January. And taking a, a day off in October limits your flexibility to take that day in April. And I know most parents, I think that's probably the one area where all parents would agree, they want to get out of school earlier in June. I mean, I, I can't, I don't know any, and I'm sure the teachers would like to get out earlier in June. So that, that's my only comment. Hazel? Getting on to that, what you're saying, not only is it uh, people wanting to get out, people have vacation plans already planned around it, unfortunately, where they put aside a lot of money and then, so we've heard about that in the past too, significantly. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. Do you notice, or Brian, maybe this is for you, do people just not come on Columbus Day? Do you find that there's a, a little higher um, absent rate for people? I, I haven't seen that. Um, I, th I think there are some seniors Mm -hmm. who do use the time to, um, no, 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 not what you think, to go visit schools. Oh, yeah, to go visit weekend, schools. That long weekend, weekend and schools will have, um, you know, they might have programs mm -hmm. or things, and so they might be narrowing down their first choice of school, mm -hmm. and they may use that weekend and, and use that third day. But uh, that's only anecdotal. You know, I, I've heard that from some, mm -hmm. some students when I was here. Um, the, I, I don't remember, though, you know, they, seeing it as a problem, Mm -hmm. in the schools as far as a drop. I will say the year we had to use the two days in April, uh, that was a significant drop mm -hmm. in the attendance. Mm -hmm. um, significant. 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, for our students, but our teachers came in. Um, so that was a little bit, but on the Columbus Day, I haven't noticed it. I don't know if you have noticed anything differently, Joe. No. no, I have not noticed it. Yeah. But it's not but. something that I've really examined or tracked. Yeah, I could, so right, we could right. certainly. No, I mean, I'm thinking mostly having kids, when you have kids in a mixed situation where one's in a school that's closed and one isn't, I sure. probably would take advantage of uh, the weekend, but I'm just curious. I do, I'll, I'll give some anecdotal evidence <laughs> because my kids were in private school for a period of time and there was a year where one was in private school right, and right. one was in public school. And um, <laughs> the one that was in public school went to school and the one in the private school, I just, you know, hung out with him for the day. And so, you know, I mean, I didn't, I didn't take the other one out of school. I, that's my own personal values though. I mean, I don't know, <laughs> you know, everybody will do something differently, but I mean, I, that's one, one person's. It depends on the foliage, I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess. Penny? Just one other factor I just noticed on this calendar, and, and check pri I checked at least one prior calendar, because it's, it's so interesting how it changes from year to year. So we actually have less flexibility uh, under our school policy at the end of the year to add days than we've had in other school Friday? years, because the 22nd is sort of one of the um, early estates that yes. can fall. So a lot of times when you look at our original calendar, we have eight days there that give us some flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think even now having shifted the calendar one day under our current program, we still have seven days. So just another factor uh, in terms of, because you do like to build in flexibility. Right. Right. right, because Friday, June 1st, it means you only have one day outside of the 15 of the the first three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Sort Whereas of like, yeah, I think that's June probably the earliest. June 1st, we're on a Tuesday, you'd mm -hmm. have four more days that you right, could use. Right, right. So we usually have, I mean, getting out the 15th is about normal, but right. we usually have a, 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 about six or seven extra days, seven or eight days sometimes extra. Right. Does any, have anybody, any more comments, questions? Okay, so could we uh, go ahead and vote then on the motion as read? Um, all those in favor of the um, uh, proposed 2017-18 school calendar is first moved and seconded by Mr. Hayes and Ms. West, respectively, on December 7th, 2015. All those in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. It's good to have, you know, it's good to have those kind of, I mean, you know, we, we should vet it all. So, yep, it is. So, thank you, Marie, for bringing that up. Okay, uh, the next action item on the agenda is a donation to Sachs Middle School. Um, Dr. Letzi, do you wanna give us a little background before I present the motion? I certainly will. Um, there has been quite a bit of discussion with, um, with Sachs and they, the PTC at Sachs. Originally, they had looked at purchasing MacBooks that were going to be used over there. Uh, but then they had another conversation, follow-up conversation with Mr. Salvestrini and Mr. Barnett, our Director of Digital Learning and our uh, Manager of Technology Services, and learned and decided that um, their money would be better spent by buying the Chromebooks instead. I think this is getting them 40 Chromebooks? Yeah. Yep, 40 Chromebooks and two carts for them that can then be used across the school all during the day. The, um, the MacBooks are, were, um, you know, certainly they're powerful and uh, would have been great devices as well, but very specialized. And they decided let's go with the Chromebooks where we can use them across the school for a variety of different purposes and functions and uh, they'll work very well on our net network. We found that the Chromebooks really are excellent devices for students to use, especially at the middle school level and in that, in that environment. Um, there's a, they're able to access the applications and the, you know, the network appropriately. So there's, it's, same or similar amount, but they're shifting the focus to buy the Chromebooks instead, which will help more students more often. So, and that's the request. It's very, very generous, um, and we're very lucky to have such generous folks. I do. I should also say, while well, I'm going, that um, I've received a couple of requests recently that were, you know, of a, a lesser amount, so not something that would come to the board for approval, but things around some some classroom supplies and materials and other things from each of the elementary schools. And it's, you know, we keep track of all of that, but it continues to be so impressive, the uh, the level of support that we receive from the community all the time. It's great. Okay. 
So uh, we have a motion to, uh, could I have a motion to approve a donation in the amount of $17,296.89 for Sachs Middle School from the Sachs PTC for the Technology Department, um, which will provide 40 Chromebooks and related accessories. We have a motion. Hazel? Second. Brennan? Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to comments from the public. Is there anyone who would like to speak? No. Ordinarily, I address this uh, committee uh, at the beginning of the meeting, but I decided on the basis of that the kids that were going to be here tonight that it would not be in their best interest to seek the resignation of a number of people tonight. Dr. Lutze? Deanna Carlson, Hazel Hobbs, Penny Ration. For years, this Board of Education has promoted a scheme or artifice to defraud the taxpayers of the town of New Canaan of the intangible right to honest services in the budget process. You do not take credits for teacher retirements in this Board of Education as they do in the town of Darien and have for years. It has a carry forward impact. If you have $100,000 saved, the following year you save that same amount of money minus 3.5%. The statement of accounts indicates this year, as of the December 31st report, I don't have the one that was just issued, that you have a significant amount of money here in salaries that's already been transferred. You don't even follow your own bylaws or your regulations in the transfer of funds. It's unlawful in this town to not follow the rule of law, which is the town charter. I'm saying to the people that have asked for the resignation that tomorrow night, there will be a substantial amount of information given to the public and to the Board of Finance to show without any doubt whatsoever the nature of the duplicity of the actions and the failure to account for the long-term savings of teacher retirements. We've had it. We've had enough of this nonsense, and it's going to stop tomorrow night. Thank you, and have a nice evening. Okay. Moving on to announcements and future meetings. Dr. Lutze. Sure. So our next uh, Board of <coughs> Education meeting is scheduled for March 7th. The March is Board Member Appreciation Month. <laughs> and we all are so very appreciative of the wonderful work that you do that you do each and every day on behalf of our schools. We are so thankful and so fortunate to have such a wonderful Board of Education, so thank you. Um, we are wrapping up our fall, our fall, uh, our winter, I'm sorry, sports season. Uh, we have senior night tonight and some others, some basketball games going on. You've probably noticed the cars out in the parking lot here. So it's, it always, I talked to Jay Egan about it today. It always surprises me the, the winter season is so short. But he says for him it's, it's so long because everything is inside and everything is at night. So he's out four or five nights a week and it's hockey and it's this and it's that. But um, we are wrapping up and we'll have a report from Jay around some of you know, how we're doing and the successes of our winter season as well. Um, and we are some presentations that we're discussing and I've got to sort of nail them down a little bit to be sure they're ready. But we'll be talking with Alan around some a VPA update uh, has been requested and some other information that will be we'll be sharing as we go forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so it's, uh, can I get a motion to adjourn? Oh, can I make one more oh, announcement? Sure. I'm Nobody so can. sorry. I just, I brought this. I know it's just, we need to show it to you. <laughs> and I want to again, congratulate the Board of Education for their honorable mention in the Awards of Excellence for Educational Communications Pro, uh, for its district budget in the 1516 budget process communications package. Out of the it's, <laughs> well, I just think it's fitting. I just think it's, it's just good timing. And uh, <laughs> so I just want to show. 
and congratulate the board one more time for its diligence and efforts, clarity of budgeting, and um, wonderful work. So yes, mileage as appropriate. Um, and I'll hand it to the chair of our communications committee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important to note. And again, I do want to yes. say thank you from all of us at the, in the schools that uh, you know we, we are working very hard to be very clear with our budget presentation, to be very upfront with all of it, to, mat to show how we are managing the funds appropriately and well. I believe that we are, and I'm kind of confident in uh, everyone on our staff that they take it this part of their job very, very seriously uh, and do a, a really a, a fantastic job. And it's important to note that at the end of each fiscal year, Board of Education doesn't carry money year to year. You know, as we look at it, we develop our budget. And we, as we developed our budget for next year, for the 16-17, um, we start fresh, we look at exactly what our needs are, we look at our staff that we have today, and we develop that budget, and that's what you have in front of you. Um, so it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, and I know the board has been a part of that from the beginning. So thank you for your efforts, but I also want to thank everybody on staff who really has done a tremendous job. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so now may I have a motion to adjourn? Jen, <laughs> second penny. <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.